I have a lot of new subscribers because Dhruv Rati shared my video on Instagram. So Dhruv, if you're watching, thank you. And if you're new here, welcome to Science is Dope. My name is Pranav. This video is something I uploaded on my channel last month, but unfortunately it got a copyright strike. So I'm going to give you some context here, but feel free to skip this section in the scroll bar uh, if you want to go to the actual video. The copyright strike on my channel has been resolved because of its fair use content, but the copyright claim still remains on my video for some reason and that's why it's blocked. Now, I've already addressed this claim, so I don't know why it's still uh, there. I've tried working with YouTube on this, but they're as helpful as an incompetent two-year-old. So I've decided to re-upload the video after removing all their clips and replacing uh, Ravi Shankar's words with just text. Hope you enjoy. First things first, I'm not making this video with the intent of insulting anyone or hurting anyone's sentiments unreasonably. I'm simply going to talk about one of the recent videos uploaded on the Shri Shri Ravi Shankar channel. The thumbnail was different when I first saw it. It said time, space and God or something. But uh, anyway, uh, I couldn't help but notice that uh, there were a lot of errors and logical fallacies that Sri Sri Ravishankar was making in this video, so we're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna call him Ravishankar from now on because it's easier to say. Now, there's a good chance that his social media team is probably watching this, in which case I'll urge them not to copyright strike me because what I'm doing is fair use. Let's begin. Hi, my name is Pranav and you're watching Science is Dope. So let me set some context here. Ravi Shankar is sitting down with a bunch of prominent scientists and uh, they ask him questions. I have no doubt in my mind that this video was either entirely scripted or at least pre-planned because uh, the questions being asked, all of them come from a perspective of the ancient scriptures from India had all these modern scientific discoveries pre-written in them. And none of them are skeptical questions, which is what I would expect a scientist to ask. Now, I have something major to say about these scientists and about science in India in general, um, but I'll say that at the end of the video. Now, I'm obviously not going to be able to cover the whole video here because it's very long, but I'll cover the most relevant sections here. If you feel I've missed something out, you can just comment below and I'll try to reply to as many as I can. The video starts with this small section about Erwin Schrodinger. Let's look at that quote again. That's actually only part of the quote. You know what's the whole quote? This is the doctrine of the Upanishads. He was directly quoting from the Upanishads when he said that, but this video makes it sound like the two statements are independent. Like uh, Schrodinger said this, and hey, look, thousands of years ago, the Upanishads said the exact same thing. What a coincidence. Well, the two statements are not independent at all. They're from the exact same source. There are many scientists who were famously fascinated with Hindu scripture like Oppenheimer or Tesla uh, and many religious folk take this as validation for their scripture when they're often just missing the point. Anyone can read scripture and be inspired by it, but they cannot make conclusions about the empirical world, about the real world from scripture. You can only make those conclusions from observations. That's what the word empirical means. Carl Sagan was a fan of Hindu mythology and he is probably one of the most staunch rationalists that I know. One of the greatest proponents of looking for evidence for claims. If anything, the takeaway here is that you can admire the literature of something without taking it literally, without making conclusions about reality from it. Let's get into the questions in the video. I'm not sure where he's getting this 10 billion years figure from. Neither is it from Hindu tradition nor is it from modern science. In Hindu tradition, the lifespan of the universe is 4.32 billion years, which is one day of Brahma. 
But remember that's the lifespan, not the age. Now this 4.32 billion years is divided into 14 Manvantaras, of which we are in the seventh. So it's more like 2.1 to 2.2 billion years. That's the age of the universe according to Hindu tradition. And modern science finds this value through observation. It finds the current rate of expansion of the universe, extrapolates it back in time and it arrives at a figure of 13.8 billion years. Now look at these two numbers and tell me how they're exactly the same. Let's look at Ravishankar's response. Now I'm not gonna show you the whole answer in the interest of time, but if you feel I've misrepresented him by taking his words out of context, I'll leave a link below. You can go watch the whole video. Let's see what he said. How can introspection or looking inwards reveal anything about the outside world? No, seriously, I, if someone knows, please tell me in the comments because if that were the case, then why are we spending all these billions of dollars on these massive space telescopes to make observations of the universe? We can just sit at home and uh, introspect and arrive at exactly the same answers, right? so much cheaper. Now if someone's gonna say that to understand this I need to experience it for myself, red flags immediately go up in my head because why is that not an excuse to prevent your claim from being shown wrong? Another thing I'd like to comment on is this small part in the original question. I don't know why he felt the need to add this part because even without it, his question is still exactly the same. But with this part, now his question has a tone of cultural superiority, which can easily fuel religious extremism. Now, I'm assuming he's talking about young earth creationists from Christianity who were terribly wrong, of course, no question. But this isn't a cultural competition to see whose guess was more accurate. All cultures were wrong because humanity back then didn't have all these tools to make observations. We do today and we have to recognize that we're all in this world together trying to figure it out. And we want to learn about the world as it is, not as we want it to be. And the best way of doing that is through observation, not by sitting at home and thinking about it. I don't think you can say that Newton rediscovered the laws when they're different. I found English translations of the Kanad Samhita and when you compare his laws with Newton's laws, they're definitely not the same. There is a similarity between Kanad's laws and Newton's first law, but that's about it. Now, this is not to say that Kanad's achievements were not great. They were for his time. The reason it didn't really catch on was because books weren't really a thing back then. There was no printing, so his works weren't accessible. And even if they were, they wouldn't really have made a difference in people's lives. Main reason being his works are qualitative, not quantitative. Uh, unlike Newton's laws, which were mathematical. His second law could help predict motion. You could tell the future position of any object that's moving by using these laws. And that made it infinitely more practical. And there was printing at this time, leading to its widespread adoption and use. Let's see what Ravishankar says. Yeah, I'm not sure you're doing anything to improve scientific temper, with this video. And also, once again, there are no winners or losers in this. This is not a competition. This is a collective effort by all of humanity to try and understand this world we live in. Another statement that can easily fuel extremism. People can use this statement to justify their hatred of people they identify as invaders. I don't think whether science was encouraged or not has much to do with who was ruling at the time. Yeah, I agree. Science is not more important than the immediate needs of the people. 
See, I'm not saying that science has all the answers to all the possible questions in the universe or it will have answers to all these questions. What it can do is answer questions that are empirical. The problem I have with this video is that he's trying to answer these scientific empirical questions using his brand of spirituality. This is called the Shanti Mitra. I've looked at several translations of this and almost none of them point to this being about the concept of zero. This example is one of many throughout this video where you'll find this idea of, hey, science or math is said this. And if we look at our scripture, thousands of years back, they said the same thing too, when that may not be the case at all. What's happening here is called hindsight bias. It's when you look behind or hindsight, when you look back at the past and uh, the way you think about it or the conclusions you make about it is influenced by what you know in the future. From the 20th century, now that you know the concept of zero, when you look back at this verse, you'll interpret it as being about zero. Now, the concept of zero was used a lot in India and there were many prominent mathematicians from medieval India who used uh, zero extensively, explored it uh, mathematically in their texts. But Ravi Shankar is not advocating for these mathematical texts, he is advocating for scripture when it should be the other way around. I believe he's talking about string theory. I don't know, he's making it very vague. Now, string theory says that all particles are made of these strings uh, that vibrate in higher dimensions. The problem with string theory is that it is not accepted by the scientific community because it's never been tested. It's still in that research phase. The current theories uh, at the forefront of physics, which are accepted widely by the scientific community, these are our best descriptions of reality. They are general relativity and quantum mechanics. And so the statement that science says that matter does not exist is wrong. These two models are talking about matter. And even if he is talking about string theory, we don't see these vibrations. These vibrating strings are what fundamental particles like quarks are made of. Let's see what Ravi Shankar says. Okay, someone please tell me what the word vibration means in the spiritual context. I know what vibration means in physics, but that's not the meaning that's being used here. So if somebody knows, please let me know. This statement is often used to justify a lot of claims by spiritual folk. I'll give you an example. Take God. You can't see God. Also, you can't see microscopic things, but you know they exist. That means God must exist too. There's a false equivalence fallacy here. Uh, God is being equated to microscopic things since you can't see both. Whereas the existence of something is dependent on whether there's evidence for it or not. There is evidence for microbes and none for God. Now he hasn't specifically spoken about God here. I just used that as an example, but many of the ideas he gets his followers to buy into are justified with the exact same statement. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Don't accept that as justification for anything because it's an easy way to get you to uh, fall into scams. What a lot of gurus do often is they answer questions with analogies. And these analogies almost always employ a false equivalence fallacy. See, he's comparing the universe to a tennis ball and he wants to reach the conclusion that the universe has no beginning or end. 
Now the tennis ball is spherical and you can say that it has no beginning or end. And the audience will take away that hey the universe has no beginning or end. Whereas he hasn't substantiated that how is the universe like a tennis ball. This is a false equivalence. Whenever you hear an analogy I can assure you it's probably a false equivalence. A point that I should add here that I didn't have in the original video is that dark matter and dark energy are not literally physically dark things. They're just placeholder names for things we don't understand yet. Just because these names use the English word dark doesn't mean you can relate it with some verse using the Sanskrit word for dark, tamas, and say they're the same, um, which is what Ravishankar has done here. There's a lot of hindsight bias here. If we didn't know about these things today, uh, would you be able to make the same interpretation? Another example of hindsight bias in this video is this. You'll often see this when people liberally interpret scripture. Make the interpretation liberal enough and you can literally find anything in scripture. Only drawback, you'll have to wait for modern science to discover it first. Let's talk about this specific question. Now, time dilation is a consequence of relativity. When something travels close to the speed of light or it's in a high gravitational field, uh, then the time it experiences dilates or lengthens as per this equation. For example, a clock in a GPS satellite ticks slightly faster because the gravity it experiences is slightly weaker compared to a clock on Earth. So when it determines a person's position on Earth, it has to correct for this uh, time difference of the clocks. This is a measurable effect of relativity that has been observed. How is any of what Ravi Shankar said even remotely related to this? If you do make a connection, then you have to admit that you're making a very liberal interpretation. You're not really interpreting scripture the way it is, but the way you want it to be. The kind of questions being asked by these professors speaks volumes about the attitude India has when it comes to science. Science is supposed to be an honest inquiry into this world to answer questions about how the universe works. And these people, these scientists would rather, uh, in, instead of answering those questions with science, they would rather answer those questions with their religion or their scripture. For them, science is just a way of getting a job and making some money, nothing more. This attitude towards science is the same thing that I've seen growing up among parents, teachers, you name it. All through school, there's never any attempt made to show students the beauty of science because according to them, that only distracts them from getting marks, which is ultimately what you need to get into that college to get that job. You know how much stress that puts on a student's mental health? They end up hating maths and science in school and do something you hate and it automatically becomes stressful. I somehow liked science despite all this, not because of schools, but because of uh, educational channels on TV and over the last decade on YouTube. And that passion for science is what drove me to create this channel. And I want to share that beauty that I see in science with all of you. If you like this video, please share it with someone who might appreciate it. I'll see you in the next one. Till then, remember, science is dope.